was born on the 1st day of January, 1926, at 59 Copenhagen Street. you say? Or, well, we were one of the better offs, one of the, uh, in the poorer section, the better off <laughs> yes. in the poorer section. Yes. Insofar as uh, my dad was at work, when he came out of the, uh, out of the uh, 1418 war, yes. he lived in Pheasant Street. Yes. And he got a job over the road at, at, that was then the Hill and Evans Vinegar Works. And he was a labourer there. So, but you see, he probably pound. He probably get a pound a week. Now, consider when you think that if he was on a dole, he'd get uh, half of that, ten shillings. Right. You see. Yeah. So you you had twice as much as another family where yeah. you were relatively better, much better off. Were there many families along your street on the dole? That oh yes, working? yes, lots. Really? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, we had. Uh, uh, aunt and uncle that lived, uh, which is which is Rose's mother and father. Right. Yeah. And they lived about six or seven doors down the road, and uh, her father couldn't get work at all. Really? No. And they had ages and ages on the door, and um, he used to go out blackberry and picking, and get these cartons, and we used to go and help him to to all around the Norton Barracks there used to be some marvellous blackberry bushes there yeah. and uh, we used to go with him and help to pick and then he used to cycle down into town to a fruit shop and get about fortnes for a uh, for a and I mean not yeah. a big big uh, what's the name of black, blackberry four pence four pence but four pence was a lot of money then you yeah. you probably get you know feed, feed the family on that four pence though. right Well, in those days, you see, um, the, especially in the winter evening, the only heating in the house was the, the open fire. And after tea in the evening, the family would sit round, because it was, we, ha we didn't have a radio at all then. Right. So apart from, say, card games or coits, something like that, yes. games, uh, basically you sat, sat round the round by the fire and, and, and the, it was general conversation and uh, we always sit there and be talking about anything like what happened today or whatever and uh, periodically dad would get up and go to the pantry to for a refill of his uh, his drinking mug uh, of, uh, of his own a barrel he used to have a barrel make a barrel full of homemade dandelion wine. Oh, right, yeah. And, and invariably, after about the third visit, struggling to get back, once he got back in, he was, his conversation was about the First World War. Yeah. And uh, he, he, would, he would talk about, uh, talk about it now. Yeah. And, um, and surprising enough, although like his war, the First World War, was was a basically a, a, a just a trench war, yeah, static trench war, pretty well. Whereas this air war was much more mobile. Yes, I mean we just dig out when we got to where we want. We just dug it uh, like a foxhole, as they call them, didn't they? Uh, we just dug that. But it was surprising that how much later, when I got into the war, how much. I remember of what he used to tell me about. Did his it was, was non-existent. Really? People couldn't afford holidays. Uh, did, go you go abro did you go abroad as a kid? Oh no, never, no. I only, un until I went into the army, I only ever went to Western once. That was with the school. Right. So, uh, how far away is Western from Worcester? 80 miles. Oh, right. So, 
that um, yeah that that was it yeah so you you played around uh, around the yeah at home like uh, yeah you see yeah with no uh, no ideas. It was a different life, really. Yeah. But apart from the poverty, it, it was, it was, you know, it was. You could become contented. It was a simple life and a quiet life, you know. Yeah. It, uh, Did you feel pressure as a kid? No, no, never, never. And I mean, everything like was based on simplicity in those days. Um, your parents weren't so geared up about your education as long as you could write, read, write, and that, that was that was it. Yes. See? Because from there you you could get on. You could you could get start a job, look, and as long as you could read and write, you could get by. Fourteen. Well, I was thirteen. Thirteen, you left school. Yes, yeah, yes. I was thirteen. Now, did your parents make you leave school at thirteen, or did you just want to? Or no, no, no. That was that was it. Right. Uh, you, uh, you. Uh, it, was, it was just the fact that we broke up about three weeks before Christmas, and I just that was it. I was fourteen just after the Christmas, so uh, I finished school then, and um, I tried a couple of jobs. And I didn't get on very well with it. Well, I got on with the one very well, but uh, uh, my mother uh, it, and it, it, what it was is the the neighbour, Mr. Evans. He was uh, a moulder at Hardy and Padmore's Iron Fa Iron Foundry. The building's still there, but it's bathrooms and so on now. Right. And um, he spoke to Dad, and he says, Alex soon be leaving, won't he? He says, yes. He says, has he got a job? He said, oh, I just don't think so. He said, well, I could do with a, a, a young chap, he said. He said, so that's a, Mr. Evans said he got on. I said, yeah, that'll do. And I went there and, and I got on with it very well. Uh, but you came out like a suit, if you'd been up a chimney. Because, <laughs> I mean, it was all black sand. Right. You see? And some of it was very fine sand. But I was you. You was your sh boots were full of black sand mm. because you was when you, you was working in it and it was. Yeah. And when I got home, of course, not you know what you are at that age. You don't stop and think like that. You get in the house. <laughs> <laughs> My mother come in. What the hell? Get out! <laughs> get out! Anyway, after a bit, I said you are you changing your job. I said, no, I like that, Mum. I said, you changing your job, I know, isn't it? So, uh, she come in one, I come on one day and she said, uh, there's a notice in, in, in the bathroom co-op, Adam Boy wanted, you go in and, and, and apply. So I thought, well, I said, no, I don't want to do that, You go on, you go and, go in and keep that job. So I thought, I know what I'll do. One night, I'll do it. Because I said, come on, have yourself a wash, tidy yourself up and go down and... Uh, so I thought, no, what I'm going to do, I'll go I'll, on my way home, uh, all black and all like that, like, and you're going in this shop, you know, Ooh! <laughs> I thought you'd hear it, oh, no, mate, don't worry. Anyway, I walked in like a, like a bloody sweet kid, you know, I, I was always been sweeping the chimney. And um, uh, so I said, can I speak to the manager? I said, I've come to see about that job you got in the window. And he looked at me. When can you start? I said, oh, <laughs> <that's the> <laughs> <laughs> So I went down and my mother says, come on, get yourself a wash and get down to that shop. I said, I've been. I've been. Oh, you've been like that? <laughs> I said, yeah. As you get on, I said, I got the job. Well, that was it. That was all right. That was all right then. Not very pleased. He said, look, lad, because I, I originally, when I, just before I was 16, uh, I think the war had been on for about 12 or 18 months. And I mean, we were in a dreadful state. I weighed up myself and thought, there's only one lot of people that seems to be hitting back 
at the Germans. And that was pilots, fighter planes and bombers. Yes. So I thought if I could get in there, you know, I might be able to do something to help help, uh, help the situation because we were in desperate straits. Yes. Desperate straits. Can you remember what year this was? It would be uh, 41, I think. About 41. Yeah. 41. So you were hearing in the news that it was get, things were getting worse and worse. Then. Oh, yes, yes. Dreadful. Dreadful. Must dreadful. have been quite a frightening time to think. Uh, well, strange enough, because being young, yeah, you don't see, you're not, you haven't experienced war, so you don't realise truly what it is until you yeah. have to have yeah. to do it. It's only then that you realise. Yeah. Because I mean, uh, obviously, your parents that have been through it understood. And when I said, "Dad, I'm going to join up," he said, "Look, son, they'll come for you." It's Soon enough, I thought I just want to have a go. Failed. You see, I, I, I passed uh, my medical uh, in Worcester and and the test paper in Worcester I passed. Right. Then I had a rail warrant to go to Warrington to the uh, Air Force there. Yeah. Uh, for a further four days test mainly written uh, and then you had to go before a selection panel of Air Force officers and explain to you like which they explained to me they said sorry but you know you haven't quite made it now we'd like you to come to us but you you could go as air crew or something else like yes and then apply again later yeah but being young and headstrong I just had set my mind on becoming a pilot. Right. Because I felt I, I could do it. Yes. Again. And a bit later on they uh, brought the calling of age from 21 down to 18. Right. So uh, just before I was 18 I had uh, the call up papers to report to Norton Barracks. There was a group of fellows out by the keep, so I joined them and we just stood there for a while and then a sergeant arrived and he, he says, Welcome to Norton Barracks, follow me. And we all went scuttling after him like, like rabbit. Anyway, we got uh, into this barrack room. It was in, in the old, very old part of the barracks and um, there was 40 in this barrack room but the trouble was, it was uh, there was only about twelve wash basins, and um, you had a, a straw palliasse to sleep on, and one blanket, and it was bitterly cold. I mean, I couldn't get much sleep anyway. But at six o'clock in the morning, the NCOs used to dash open the door, come running down, turfing everybody out to bed, shouting outside for PT in five minutes, and. Uh, that was the beginning of our six week primary training. Right. Which was basically just to change it from a civilian and into a soldier. Yeah. And learning the disciplines of the army and yeah. being introduced to your equipment and how to how to wear it and, and how to blanco it and how, how did you feel at that time? Were you nervous about doing this or excited? How, how would you explain your feelings at the time? I hated it. Oh. I, I really hated it, I did, because I, 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 I that's why I, I was, I, I didn't like a lot of discipline, mm. and I mean, I was all discipline though, yeah. but you had to stick it, you know, as much as I hated it. The officers in the army. Oh, cracky. But you, you, I'll give you an example. In your primary training, you had uh, further uh, medicals and exa uh, eyes examined, teeth examined, because they had the dentist up there. Look. Now, I, I'd had to have a couple out and some adults done and some else done. So I went in, the, the dentistry was up on the far corner of the, what's the name? Well, I, when I came out, they take me teeth out. 
and I was coming back to the barrack room and I was coming across the square and I was bleeding like a pig, you know. So I just went put me to get around and all of a sudden, get to a hundred fucking bad man, you know, right in one of the RSMs I suppose, like, and their yeah. voices going up. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see the sort of uh, yeah. the sort of yeah. the discipline. It was uh, <clears throat> and um, the, uh, we we had six weeks of introduction to the army, really, and and like we went on the thirty yards firing range. That's at the barracks. Yes, um, to show you how to fire a rifle. And now to carry out safety precaution like and so forth, yeah. all those sort of things you've done, and yeah. introducing you to your equipment. But the the worst part was that when we picked up our rifle, it was just one big blob of grease. Oh. And I said, "We'll examine these rifles." Oh my God! You know, uh, you're going to examine them about our. So everybody said, "How can we get this grease off?" Boil us some water. The only way. So uh, somebody was boiling water and we were scrubbing away at them, you know, and, uh, <coughs> and that, that, for the first six weeks, that, uh, and, and you had to um, learn to salute properly. Uh, you were introduced, when, when we, in, in the first six weeks, primary training, you were handed a, a rifle, a 303 rifle, right. that held a magazine of five rounds. Yeah. Now, after you cleaned it off and it had been inspected, then you went on the prey ground with the rifle and it, you were introduced to the rifle by drilling with it. Okay. Various movements to get you to know and handle the rifle. Yeah. And I think they were about nine pounds or something like that, right. you know, and shoulder arm and present arm. You learned all those sort of things, handling the rifle, getting to know your rifle. Yeah. The next stage was on the 30 yards range at the barracks to fire your rifle with live ammunition at the target. Right. And the uh, procedures uh, of uh, how to correctly uh, handle your weapon with, with live bullets yeah. and then the procedure uh, after you fired. Now initially uh, you can tell us really the type of training we were getting, how sort of really out of date it was in, in so far as we was in the Second World War <coughs> and with only five rounds in your magazine you were supposed to count every shot you made so that you would know yes. when you were out. Right. But, you know, in action, to think you could do that, it was, was rather, yeah. uh, it's all, it was all right a hundred years ago, you know, when the uh, Zulus was coming three miles away, <laughs> by, <laughs> like one, <laughs> missed him, like a, you know, <laughs> you could perhaps operate it. But when you've got, uh, you've got tanks and that coming at you like that, you know, yeah. to, to say I'm on my fourth bullet, you know. Yes. Uh, and then just imagine you've got to stop and reload your magazine, which you which you, you can't do in a second, look. Right. Because you've got to you've got a bandolier where you've got to get your bullets out and and put them in and put your magazine in. Right. But you were taught all those things about your weapon. Yeah. Yes, well this is, we're, we're now coming towards the end of our training. Right, six weeks? We were on the last week of a ten weeks intensive infantry training right. at Wally Range, uh, Lancashire. Right. And there was no let up during the last week. We had 30 mile route marches, 10 mile run and walk, wading through streams, waist high, water waist high, uh, chest high nearly. Right. Then your rifle checked to see if you kept it ready to to use it like. Yeah. Uh, very hard uh, assault courses with live ammunition being fired over. Right. Uh, schemes on compass bearing schemes throughout the night, digging in. So by the time we finished, we were just like on our uppers, but also 
very fit really, you know, yeah. because it was it was all go. Yeah. We were then allocated um, a week's leave. Right. Then, after the week's leave, we reported back, and on the same day, we got on a train uh, for quite a long journey. Now, during the war, they took all the names from stations because of uh, fifth columnists and bodies. Yes. So, as you passed station, normally you'd see the name, you'd know where you were, you couldn't. Ah. So, because the, the, the government had taken all the names away from station. Yes. Anyway, we get to this place and everybody's looking, trying to say, where do you think we are? And one bloke said, well, I think we, this is Southampton. So, we assumed he was right, and we got off the train, got onto some vehicles, and uh, went through the town. Now, as we were going through the town, the people was waving and shouting, good luck, you know. Oh, wow. And any money we had left, we were throwing it to them, because we, we wouldn't want it, you know. Yeah. So we th we were throwing it, get yourself a point, mate, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and you're good. <laughs> anyway, we, we motored on out of town into a wooded area. We got out, walked through this wood into a large tented area. And we just had instructions. Out of bounds is uh, not to, to go outside company lines because it was out of bounds. Right. So there we stayed for I should say twenty four hours or more, and then we we were out onto the trucks, down to the boats, got on a boat, and sailed. I think the name of it was Aramanches in France. Right. Normandy. Yeah. 